Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the global energy transition today. And at Bloomberg NEF, we think the global energy transition is the most important value creation opportunity of our generation. So I want to talk a bit about that today, talk about how we see the role of South Korea in the global energy transition, and also why now is a time to seize the opportunity. Just quickly, um, for those of you who don't know Bloomberg NEF or BNEF, uh, we are a research provider. Um, so all we do all day is we gather data and we write research about the global low carbon transition. We cover the commodities markets, including oil and gas and coal, and also the carbon markets. We cover sector transitions, all of the different opportunities and technologies in clean power, transport, industry, and agriculture. We cover cross-cutting technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, bioenergy, and we also look at how corporations and financial institutions are navigating those opportunities and managing their own sustainability as well. Um, so that's just kind of what we cover and how we think about the world. But let me kick things off by saying, as we all know, we are living in the age of climate change. Uh, this is a picture from here in Seoul, South Korea, uh, one year ago during the floods that, that affected the city last summer. But this isn't a story about Seoul or about South Korea. This is a story about the whole world. So whether you live in Canada or California or Italy or Greece or China or India or Pakistan, you are being affected. You're seeing floods and wildfires and droughts and storms the like of which we've never seen before. And we are now already at 1.1 degrees Celsius of global warming. We've already hit 1.1 degrees compared to the uh, temperature levels um, on planet Earth before industrialization. The red line here is the actual temperatures observed, um, measurements over the last century, more than a century. And the blue area is the modeled estimation and so you can see the models are actually very accurate. The models are very good at predicting where we are and in, indeed where we are going in future. And every year, we go further into uncharted territory. Um, every year, there are different records being broken around the world. This is just one example. This is the sea surface temperature during the first half of 2023 compared to all the other years in the record. And you can see this year, we've started to see a very strong deviation from history uh, because of climate change and also because of the beginning of the El Nino weather pattern this year. So just one example of the kind of uncharted territory we're, in, we're entering. Now, as you know as well, humanity has agreed to tackle this challenge. In 2015, more than 190 countries signed the Paris Agreement, which says we will uh, limit global warming to well below two degrees um, uh, compared to pre-industrial levels. And we will aim for 1.5 degrees. We'll aim for 1.5 degrees. Three years later, the IPCC, which is the UN's climate science body, issued its special report, which has done so much to advance the conversation on climate change. And it said, in this special report, it said, if we are going to achieve 1.5 degrees, the world needs to half its carbon emissions by 2030 and reach net zero globally by the middle of this century. So we need to eliminate all of our carbon emissions globally by the middle of this century. And since then, in 2019, 2020, 2021, we saw more and more countries take this net zero goal and turn it into their own country's goal. First the UK, then, then Europe, China, of course, South Korea as well. And now those government net zero goals, um, as we actually heard this morning, um, those government net zero goals now account for 90% of the world's emissions. So 90% of the world's emissions are now committed either by a government or a subnational target um, of some form to reach net zero. So if we can achieve these goals, we are going to get very close to achieving the goals that the IPCC has set forth. Now, this may be an obvious point, but I think it's worth saying. If we're going to reach net zero globally, that means every sector of the economy has to reach net zero. So a few years ago, we used to say, we need to reduce emissions by 60%, or we need to reduce emissions by 80%. And so if you're a company or an industry, you can say, well, I will be in the last 20%. I will be in the last 20%. So everyone else can decarbonize. But now we want to get to net zero. That means every sector has to get to net zero. And at BNF, we've done a lot of modeling about different scenarios to 2050. Our net zero scenario um, shows that if we act quickly, we can reach 1.7 degrees Celsius. 1.5 looks very difficult now. We think 1.77 is still very much achievable. Okay, so we've talked about the need to tackle the climate crisis, and we often talk about moral responsibility, we must do this, we must do that. But the other side of the coin is that energy transition is also 
and is already a significant opportunity. This is a picture from uh, Gohung here in, uh, in South Korea, um, and you can see it's a floating solar PV plant. And I think it's a great example of the kind of innovation that we're seeing, the new business models that we're seeing emerging in the energy transition. And so in our research, we do a lot of data gathering and we follow where the money is flowing in these new opportunity areas. And last year, 2022, we tracked more than $1 trillion of investment in the energy transition. And by energy transition here, we mean all of these low carbon technologies. So low carbon energy supply, like renewable energy, nuclear, energy storage, CCS is carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, and also demand site technologies like electric vehicles, electric heat pumps, sustainable materials is kind of clean industry, decarbonization of steel and things like that. And all of these sectors together attracted $1.1 trillion of investment last year, up 30% from the year before. So this is a trend that is growing very, very quickly. And this $1.1 trillion, for the first time, matched the amount of investment into fossil fuels globally. So the green bar is the energy transition and the pink bar here is fossil fuel supply investment. You can see fossil fuel supply investment has grown the last two years because of the energy crisis. But even despite that, the green bars have matched the pink bars for the first time and probably for the last time because they're going to continue to grow and I don't think the pink bars will continue to grow. Now, underneath that 1.1 trillion, there's a lot of different things. So the two biggest pieces are electric vehicles and renewable energy. Electrified transport, including electric vehicles, is 466 billion, and that's growing very rapidly. That's the fastest growing sector. And then renewable energy is 495 billion. That's still the largest sector, and the growth there is driven primarily by solar. Solar is really the growth driver in renewable energy. Between these two sectors, that's almost all of the money. But there are also other sectors which are much smaller, but really important. So less mature technologies like hydrogen, like carbon capture and storage. These are technologies that are not yet at commercial scale, but we know they need to be at commercial scale by 2030 if we're going to get on track for net zero. And the good news is we're starting to see that growth. So hydrogen investment tripled last year to one billion, and carbon capture and storage investment also nearly tripled up to six billion dollars. So we're seeing really good signs there. And when we look forward, all of that investment data is looking backwards. Now I'm going to show you some forecasts. Uh, which is really what we do at BNF, is a lot of forecasting. This is our latest forecast for global installations of wind, uh, so, uh, solar, and energy storage um, on the power grid. Um, this year, we expect about 400, uh, 450 or so gigawatts of new installations. That these are annual installations, so just this year. And by 2030, that's going to be more than 800 gigawatts. So we're talking about doubling the speed of deployment between now and 2030. This is our forecast. This is what we predict. And this amount of solar is enough to get on track for that net zero scenario, for that 1.7 achieving um, net zero by 2050. Wind is not quite on track. We need wind to move faster, but solar looks like it's already on track. And you will have heard over the last couple of years that there have been a lot of supply chain challenges um, in these sectors. You will have heard that there's been a polysilicon shortage. Perhaps you've heard that wind turbine prices have risen. Um, and it's true that wind turbine prices are still elevated. Battery prices are still elevated because of the costs of materials. But interestingly, solar prices are already back to record low levels, which has been a, an incredible achievement because we saw a huge increase in solar costs uh, over the last two years. But the supply chain has already responded and solar module costs are already back down to record lows and we think will continue to fall. And over the next couple of years, we expect wind, uh, wind turbine costs and uh, battery costs to come down as well. And even regardless of all of that, if you take the all-in uh, lifetime costs of different uh, energy uh, power plant technologies, if you compare coal and gas and solar and wind on a lifetime levelized cost basis, the cost of the technology, the cost of installation and engineering, the cost of operations and maintenance and fuel, on a global average basis, solar and wind are competitive against gas and coal and are actually cheaper than gas and coal. Now, it's not true in every single country, but on, on a global average in the vast majority of countries, wind and solar continue to be the cheapest form of electricity worldwide, which is really what's been driving all of the growth. On electric vehicles, we were also projecting very strong growth. Last year, about 10 million electric vehicles were sold globally. This year, it'll be 14 million. And by 2026, we expect it to be about 26 million. So we're talking about a doubling of the market over the next three years for electric vehicles. And that would be equivalent to reaching 30% of global car sales by 2026. And some markets are going much, much faster. You can see the, 
The top line here is China, which we expect to reach 50% electric vehicles by 2026, and Europe at about 40%. And again, it's a similar story uh, to renewables. In electric vehicles, what's really driving this is cost. We've watched the price of lithium-ion battery packs fall by about 90% over the last 10 years. Today, battery packs are about $150 per kilowatt hour. That's up from the year before due to rising metal prices. But we expect by 2025, those costs will come down to around $120 per kilowatt hour. And at that point, in some countries, for some types of cars, the purchase cost of an electric vehicle will be lower or equal or lower than an internal combustion engine. And that will be a real tipping point um, in those markets. And between 2025 and 2031, more countries will cross that tipping point. More countries, more car types. It'll be different years in different countries and different models. Whether it's an SUV or a big car or a small car, it's going to be a little bit different. But between 2025 and 2031, that's going to be the sweet spot when EVs start to get cheaper um, than internal combustion engines. And from there, um, uh, we're, we're going to see even more acceleration. So for the last section of this presentation, I just want to share a few thoughts about achieving global net zero. I showed you earlier our scenario, the net zero scenario that achieves global net zero by 2050, 1.77 degrees, achieving the Paris Agreement goal of well below two degrees. And that comes from a report we do each year called the New Energy Outlook. And I just want to show you a few findings from that New Energy Outlook, just to give you an idea of how we see the world potentially being able to achieve net zero. And this is probably the single most important chart from our new energy outlook this year. This is an emissions chart. So the history of this is those are the carbon emissions from oil, gas, and coal up to 2021. And it's been rising globally. We, we all know that. The top line, the no transition line, is that's what happens to global emissions if, if we stop the energy transition now. If we stop all of the investment into clean energy, then this, that emissions continues to rise from around 30 billion tons a year to somewhere around 50 billion tons a year by 2050. And that is a climate disaster, of course. The bottom line here is getting to net zero. And all of the colors in between those lines are the solutions that will make the difference in our analysis. And we do this based on cost. So we're deploying the least cost technologies to achieve that gap from no transition to a full net zero transition. Half of the solution is clean power. So if we can deploy clean power technologies, decarbonize the electricity system, we already get halfway there. Another quarter is electrification. That's electric vehicles, electric heat pumps, electrifying industry. So already you're talking about three quarters of the solution is clean electricity and electrification. And then there's an important role for hydrogen at 5%, bioenergy 6%, carbon capture and storage 10%. So those all play a role. And we need all these technologies to get to net zero. But clean power and electrification are really, really key, really the backbone. And because of that, electrification in the net zero scenario means a huge increase in the global um, electricity system. Here I'm showing both scenarios. So we have the economic transition scenario on the left, which, as I mentioned, is least cost, and the net zero scenario where we do achieve net zero. And in the net zero scenario, we will be producing three times more power around the world in 2050 as we do today because of electrification of vehicles and buildings, but also because we need clean electricity in order to produce green hydrogen. And that drives a huge amount of power demand. That power system, that tripling of, of the power system, is built largely around renewable energy. Again, wind is in blue, solar in yellow. And again, it doesn't matter so much which scenario you look at, because both scenarios are going to be dominated by wind and solar, both the economic transition and the net zero scenario. But if you take the net zero scenario, we're talking about roughly three quarters of the world's power coming from wind and solar, and then the last quarter coming from a mix of different technologies that will be required for flexibility and for backup. And that includes nuclear, it includes biomass, and it includes carbon capture and storage with gas and coal, and a little bit of hydrogen as well. That backup capacity is incredibly important. I don't want to minimize that. So we need that backup capacity, and in fact, we need much more of it. Today, there's about 6,000 gigawatts globally of uh, dispatchable generation, gas, coal, hydro, nuclear, things like that. And in the net zero scenario by 2050, it's almost 12,000 gigawatts. And it includes a lot of batteries and a lot of carbon capture and storage and some hydrogen as well. But it's really important to bear in mind that these technologies, except for nuclear, most of these technologies will only be used for a small fraction of the year at times when the wind is not blowing and when the sun's not shining. 
they're not going to be running all year round like they do today. And that's what this chart on the right is showing here. And in fact, hydrogen is only running about 10% of the time. So we have this view that there will be some power generation from hydrogen, but it's only going to be used at certain times when there's no resource available. And then hydrogen and carbon capture play, play a huge role. So I've already mentioned hydrogen in the power sector, but the total amount of hydrogen in the economy is going to grow five times. Today, there's about 100 million tons of hydrogen being used, uh, mainly for the energy industry, and it's all fossil-based hydrogen, which is, um, has a carbon footprint. By 2050, in the net zero scenario, it's 500 million tons of hydrogen, and it has to be clean hydrogen. It has to be either green hydrogen uh, from renewables or blue hydrogen from carbon capture and storage. And many, many different sectors will use it, but the most important will be the steel production sector, where steel um, will be very dependent on hydrogen for decarbonization. And then on carbon capture and storage, we project about seven gigatons of carbon capture and storage capacity being required to meet, to meet net zero. Today, there's only about 50 megatons. So this is a huge, huge increase in carbon capture and storage. So I've talked a lot about opportunities and a lot about investment and where it's all going. I have just one slide about challenges, but there are many, many challenges, so I, I don't want to pretend there are no challenges. One is grid capacity. We need a much bigger, much stronger, much smarter electricity grid all around the world to manage this transition. And the other one is metals supply. We've put our net zero scenario um, into our uh, uh, metals uh, supply and demand projections. And the demand projections here are very stark. In our net zero scenario, we need 12 times more lithium than we have today. We need two times more copper and cobalt and nickel than we have today. And we need more manganese and more aluminum. Not all of that demand is driven by the energy transition. So only the colored sections are energy transition demand. Of course, we use copper and nickel for other things. Um, so we look at the total. But our current projections of supply for each of these minerals is not sufficient uh, to provide enough supply for net zero. So this is something that really requires attention and investment and regulatory support as well. So there are going to be challenges. But I do want to end. So this is actually my last slide. I want to end by going all the way back to the beginning and talking about how we do think this is the most important value creation opportunity of this generation, you know, between now and 2050. And as part of our net zero scenario, we worked out how much investment is required to actually achieve um, that transition. And the answer is almost $200 trillion, $196 trillion to be invested between now and 2050 globally to reach net zero. And those investments span a lot of different technologies, low carbon power, carbon capture, electricity grids, hydrogen, um, a huge amount of EV sales. Um, about half of the investment goes to EV sales. But really, all these different sectors have opportunities here to be part of the transition. And so our view is that no sector can afford to ignore this opportunity. And that's why we say that now is the time to seize the opportunity in the global energy transition. Thank you very much.